How do you get rid of shin splints? How do you run safely past dogs? How do you regulate your temperature post run? And what are the best budget running packs? Find out in my Q&A series, answering all your trail and ultra running questions. This film is powered by LoomFit, the reflective LED vest for running safely in the dark. Hello, I'm Claire and you're watching Wild Ginger Running, the trail and ultra running advice and inspiration channel. Subscribe if you like this film and look for links to anything I talk about in the film description below. Firstly, thanks for telling everybody about Wild Ginger Running. The social media heroes this week are Mark Johnston, 4D Runs, Andrew Ryder and Steve Baker who told people about my gear reviews and advice films. Thank you guys, it's brilliant. It's incredible to think that we're up to 9,000 subscribers now, so just thanks all of you so much for helping to create such a brilliant community of like-minded trail and ultra runners in under two years. It's absolutely fantastic. And thanks to anybody who let me know that I'd missed a key race in last fortnight's film about the top 10 UK 100 milers here. Cornwall's arc of attrition got so many mentions, I lost count. So that one should definitely be added to the top 10. The only question now is, which one should we boot out? Let me know in the comments below. Keep your questions coming, gear, training, nutrition, racing, whatever your query, type it in the comments below so that I can help you out in next fortnight's Q&A. Now, let's answer that first question. Patron Guy Greatorex wants advice on shin pain. It sounds like you have the dreaded shin splints, Guy. I used to get this when I first started running, but thankfully not so much now. Here's Paul Hobra's best advice on how to deal with them from his book, Running Free of Injuries. Paul has been physio to world marathon record holder Paula Radcliffe and Steve Cram, who held the British 1,500 metres record for 28 years before Mo Farah broke it in 2013. So if anyone can help you beat them once and for all, it's Paul. So shin splints are very common, especially for beginner runners or those running too far, too fast, too soon after coming back from running after a layoff. So Paul says the key is first to stop running and reduce the inflammation with ice and compression and then when the pain has eased book a massage on your calf muscles. Then start to slowly strengthen and lengthen your muscles. He says it's also worth getting an assessment on your biomechanics to see if there's an overload of the tibialis muscle group from poor form. So in Paul's book, there's a whole list of treatment and rehab exercises for shin splints. He prescribes towel grabbing, calf stretches, calf raises, toe raises, tibialis posterior strength moves, shin stretches and glute stretches. He recommends doing these before bed for maximum recovery time and reduce chances of injuring fatigued muscles. Don't run until the pain has reduced dramatically, then try for three minute intervals of running, followed by walking at a steady pace on a treadmill on an incline. Over the next few weeks, build back into running by slowly reducing the incline and rest periods and increasing the running intervals. Stopping at regular intervals also to stretch out your calf muscles. You could also try aqua jogging and cycling and swimming to keep your cardio going until your running is back up to speed. So I hope that helps you Guy and good luck with your shin splints. Question 2. TT is concerned about dogs on his run. What do you do when they aren't under control and start running towards you and leaping up at you and potentially going into the attack? Well, most owners are really good at keeping unruly dogs on leads when others come past, but as runners, not only can we pop up quickly and unexpectedly, but we can also excite the dog and elicit a sort of chase me, chase me type scenario. So this is potentially a very scary situation, especially if you've had bad experiences in the past or if the dog isn't well trained. So I always find that the best thing to do is to slow down to a walk past unleashed dogs so they don't get the urge to chase you. And also you can avoid looking them in the eyes so they don't find you threatening. Come to a stop if necessary, giving the owner time to catch up and get the dog on its lead. And if the dog jumps up at you, then all the advice online says to turn your body away from it, cross your arms across your chest so that your hands aren't dangling around temptingly for a bite 
tight. You could also try firmly but calmly saying off or down in the hope that the owner uses these commands too. Back away slowly without turning your back on the dog and resist the urge to panic and run. So this should work in most cases, but if this still fails and the dog does try to attack, use your backpack or a nearby object to shield yourself, protecting your face and neck. If it gets really, really nasty, like yell for help, fight back, hit the dog on the nose or the neck and, and try and immobilize its head and jaw so it can't bite you. But hopefully it won't get to this stage. It is really rare. Mostly following this earlier advice will prevent a full-on attack from happening. However, funny story. So I've never been bit by a dog before in my life. A couple of friends have while I've been out running with them, but I have never been bit. So yesterday I prepared the answer to this question. And then this morning I went for a run and what do you know, I got bit by a dog. I did the whole arms crossed, turn around. And at that point, the dog bit me on the thigh. And at that point, I was like, no more Mrs. Nice Guy. I, I didn't shout, but I definitely spoke very firmly to the dog and I just said, no. And then I said, down, like that. I just said it really, really quite commandingly. Uh, as if you'd talk to your own dog that was playing up. and miraculously the dog backed away uh, but it was really really scary because it was massive it was an Irish wolfhound and there was two of them and then this huge um, brown Labrador came running towards us as well so there was three of them surrounding me in this farmyard and the only reason I was in the farmyard was that the public footpath goes straight through so I was walking I wasn't running at the time because I have been there before and I do know that there's some big dogs there but they've never been a problem in the past they just saw me on my own and they just went for me that day and it was really really scary. I've got a big bruise on the side of my thigh now and I did actually report it. I rang the farmer that owns the farm. I couldn't get through so I left a message and then I just reported it to the non-emergency police line because imagine if that was a kid or an older person or a person who wasn't quite so confident around dogs and like they panicked and ran and then the dogs followed them and attacked them even more. Police do take it seriously so I would definitely advise anyone who has been bitten by a dog to call the 101 number. So now not only have I got a massive bruise on my thigh but I will also have to try and find another route for my beginner trail run on Sunday. So, a good question asked at a good time, TT. I hope that nobody else goes through this experience. I hope that that advice does work for everybody, but if in doubt, very firmly tell the dog off and down, because that worked for me, and I just hope it works for you guys as well. Just tell them who's boss, that's what I reckon. Question three, Lars Laird Iverson asks why his temperature regulation goes haywire with hot flushes and chills after a high mileage week or back to back runs. So I often get very cold after runs, but nothing like the symptoms you've described. So I asked ultra running doctor Beth Pascal for her advice. So she's a pediatrician. It's not her area of expertise, but she says she has heard of it happening before and it's possible it could be to do with the thyroid gland as more thyroxine is released after heavy exercise, which is pretty key in metabolism and thermoregulation. So she says it would be worth seeing your GP and getting your thyroid function tested. Your basal metabolic rate will also be higher with high volume training, which will also increase your body temperature slightly. And if you're not well hydrated, your peripheries may feel cool. So keeping well hydrated will also help with temperature regulation, whatever the cause. Essentially, it could be a few things, but excluding thyroid problems would be an important thing to do as a first step. Beth says she hopes that helps you, Lars, and thanks to Beth for answering this one. See her interview here, and she is doing the Western States 100, so follow her on social media too. Quick fire questions, loads of running pack questions this time. So One Mile No Sweat asks how to store poles when you're not using them. If you might use them again soon, just carry them in one hand. If you know you won't be using them for a while, fold them up and when you're on the go, attach them to your running pack using the dedicated pole loops, which may look like this across the chest or this at each side of the shoulder strap. Salomon make a special quiver attachment for some of their packs and you can also do some DIYing and attach a quiver to non-Salomon packs. In Wild Ginger World, we call this a Franken pack. Carol Jackson wants to know when I'll be reviewing the new Salomon Advanced Skin 8 Women's Pack. It's on its way, Carol. Watch out for a review of it. As soon as I get my hands on it, I can't wait. In the meantime, all my other pack reviews are here. Omicido asks what I think about the Carrymore X Lite running pack. So 
I think it's okay, but it's 40 quid with no shoulder strap pockets, so I'd consider it more of a hiking pack with handy hip belt pockets. Instead, for a budget pack, I would go for the Kalenji trail running pack from Decathlon for £28, or even better, the ANEG 10 litre running pack for around 40 Links are in the description below, and reviews of all these packs are in the link that I just put up for Carol's question too. Trail Ue asks what I think of the Nikkor HC30. It looks like a good torch, good value at £45 and light at about 130 grams, including the strap and the battery. However, although it boasts a thousand lumen beam, it actually doesn't last as long as some slightly less bright, more expensive and heavier petzl and silver equivalents. So the HC30 lasts for one hour at a thousand lumens and then only 3.5 hours on high, which is 400 lumens. In contrast, the petzl now is more than twice the price at 100 10 grams, weighs more at 185 grams, but its 750 lumen reactive lighting lasts for 6.5 hours. This silver Crosstrail 5 is 91 pounds and heavier at 230 grams, but it burns for 500 lumens for six hours. So I've not tried the HC30 myself, but it does look like a good head torch for the price if you're on a budget, but if you can stretch, the Petzl Now is a better long-term investment, I think. If anyone else has tried the HC30, let us know in your comments below. That would be really helpful. Gustav Linkovic asks why I didn't use waterproof socks to keep my feet dry on the Cape Wrath Ultra. So I did at first, but they don't keep your feet totally dry after 30 plus miles, as you can't prevent sweating inside them and, and you go through knee high rivers. So there's no way a waterproof sock can cope with that. So then I actually chose to wear non-waterproof socks as my blisters worsened because the water lubricated and cooled my feet down. They were an agony of chafing when they were drier. So that's why I didn't wear waterproof socks. And it just goes to show that some things you just can't learn without doing a race, without taking that risk and potentially setting yourself up for a DNF. So see my talk about how to take positives from a DNF that did not finish here. News! Pickle juice is real. I have long thought that the Americans were actually just winding me up when I went to Pikes Peak and they told me that they drank pickle juice to ward off cramps, but this photo from Tom Avery of his friends on last year's Oachita Trail proves that they aren't just having me on. I have yet to try some, but next time I get the opportunity to visit the States, I'm definitely going to give it a go. In real news, the Middle East seems to be the place to go trail running at the moment with news that Mike Wardian, interviewed here, should be starting his FKT in Israel this week. And Robbie Britton and Dan Lawson are right now cracking on with their 650 kilometer Jordan Trail FKT in, you guessed it, Jordan. Follow them on social media for more. Closer to home, Innovate Athlete and double Bob Graham round and double Ramsey round record holder Nikki Sphinx and her team of three other far running ladies won the women's race at the 40 mile overnight high peak marathon in the Peak District this month, coming fourth overall. Congratulations ladies. First overall was a mixed team from Carnethy, including spine race record breaker Jasmine Paris, her husband Conrad Rawlick, Jim Mann and Ian Whiteside. So congrats to all of them, that's absolutely fantastic running through the night. Then excitingly, so wild ginger running news, the exclusive patron supporter buffs are here. These are limited edition and made very kindly for free thanks to Om and Buff, the headwear company that originally invented them. So these super useful fabric tubes can be worn in a multitude of ways. They're worth £13 each and as I promised to my awesome patron team, I'll be sending them to each $10 plus supporter to reward them for three months loyalty. I thought this would be a fantastic way for us all to recognise each other in races and running about the countryside hills and mountains. I'm really excited about sending these out. I've had a few requests to buy the buffs already but because of the freebie arrangement that I have with Almond Buff, I'm not allowed to sell these. They are exclusively for patron supporters. However, if you'd really like some Wild Ginger Running merchandise, you can still buy a t-shirt at any time, modelled excellently by Hugo Kramer and his wife here. Follow the link in the film description below. Life is looking pretty good for Wild Ginger Running patron supporters right now as the March competition is looking fantastic. At the end of this month there will be three lucky winners. So the first prize is £500 worth of Innovate kit, Maverick Trail Race places, a Lumifit reflective LED running vest and the new Wild Running book from Jen and Sim Benson. The second prize is another Wild Running book. Third prize is Jog On by Bella Mackey on how running saved her life. 
So to be in with a chance to win, visit my Patreon page and sign up for the $5 monthly tier. Not only is it a great way to show your support for my channel and keep it going, but you have way better odds of winning this competition than the lottery. It's question time. Last time I asked how far everyone usually runs per week and Isatina Ariz says that she's not doing any ultras in 2019 so she's keeping her training consistent with 25 to 30 miles per week. That sounds good Isatina. Keep up the great running. This time I'd like to know what's the furthest you've ever run in one go and do you want to run further? So the furthest I've run in one go is 65 miles on the Bob Graham round in 2013 and now the furthest I want to run is probably around the 30. 30 mile mark. Anything after that just hurts and I like to be honest with everybody on here so I don't mind admitting that I've done the whole pain thing and I'm now just about enjoying my trail running without suffering these days. However, I'm in full support of any of you that want to run as far as you like, just go for it. I'm keen to hear your distance stories so comment below and keep those trail and ultra running questions coming so I can answer as many as I can in next fortnight's Q&A. Subscribe if you haven't already, click the notifications bell so you don't miss out on any new videos and thank you for watching, thanks to all my incredible patrons. Have fun, enjoy your run and I will see you on the trails.